Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. If you're ready, somebody say, yeah. yeah. Here we go. It says this. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. Anybody woke up in the morning, start your day, and your knee decided not to join you? Am I the only one getting old? It's a random Tuesday. Your back said, I ain't coming today. Go ahead. Have your day. I'll be here in bed if you need me. <laughs> it said, and if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, and here's the part, somebody say, God. God has place, not evolution, not two rocks exploding in space. I ain't some polywog that climbed out of a dirt ditch and dropped my tail. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. We're thankful for this moment. God, in your presence. God, it's a bold statement to say that we're in your presence, but you said wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you'll be also, God. If you're here, healing is here. Freedom is here. All that we stand in need of is in this moment. So God, we pray that you'd speak, and as you speak, we will obey. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. We are in uh, that season in the Chandler household. We're getting a Band-Aid is the biggest event of our week. Not only is it the biggest event of our week, but it seems to be a weekly event. Everybody is getting a Band-Aid at some point every single week. We got a six-year-old, a five-year-old, a two-year-old, and they just need band -Aid. Now, I'm proud of the kids because last year, we were putting Band-Aids on stupid stuff like mosquito bites and all that other kind of stuff. Daddy, I got a boo. Now, they're bleeding this summer. They're actually earning their Band-Aids. We're falling off of bicycles. We're jumping off of swings at the top and not quite sticking the landing. We're playing soccer on the cement. We are, they're earning their, now their mom's horrified. She's just like, oh my gosh, they're bleeding. I'm like, babe, this is a childhood. How can you say you had a childhood and you did not bleed? I mean, just think about any man, I don't know how y'all do in Houston, any real man, if you ask him, there is some scar on his body that you, he was, Biggles, let me tell you where I got this. Am I right? And there's a whole story. You should see the other guy of where that scar came from. But my kids, they got their love of adventure from me. But they got their drama <laughs> from their mama. <laughs> when my kid falls off of their bike, if you didn't see the fall, you would think they broke their neck. I mean, they are screaming bloody, right? <laughs> I'm like, you're not going to die. You're going to be okay. And I'm like, how are you in that much pain, but you can still talk to me? No, I'm not going to be okay. <laughs> we grab them, and I'll dust them off. And all right. my wife's like, babe, bring them inside. I was like, no, it's summertime. We ain't going inside. We go get the water hose and put the water hose on that thing and <laughs> just add dirt to the wound. It'll, it'll heal it all up. It'll be good. And dust them off. And then comes a moment where they get to pick a Band-Aid. Now, back in the day, a Band-Aid was a Band-Aid. It's a little brown Band-Aid put on, you're good to go. Not nowadays. Nowadays, they got Paw Patrol Band-Aids. They got little Mermaid Band-Aids. They got, I mean, every different kind. And it's like an ordeal to pick a Band-Aid. They get their Band-Aid, they put it on. And you would think after they got the Band-Aid, it's over. No, it has just begun. Because for the next three days straight, they cannot straighten that leg at all. You would think they were in a car accident. Why? Because they're waiting for somebody to ask them what happened. No, I, I got a Band-Aid. I got a woo. And I promise you, we, we, we were raised right. We bathe our children every single day. But for some reason, that Band-Aid will survive that bath. And by day four, I'll say, all right, Roman, all right, Zoe, we've got to take the Band-Aid off so the wound can get some air so it can... I'm not going to preach that message today. Preach that message to yourself on the drive home. There's a message called rip the Band-Aid off. Come on now. Some of y'all have been nursing the same wound for the last seven years. Rip the Band-Aid. 
They've got to take the bandit off that wound us to get some air so it can heal. You can't tell me my God is not great. You can't tell me he's not magnificent. Just look at the human body, y'all. Our body heals itself. You, you don't got to think about the healing. You, you really don't even have to pray over that healing. If you've got a cut, your body will heal itself. And it doesn't just heal, but it heals in stages. The, the first stage of healing is called hemostasis. And that's where the body stops the bleeding. Before we can disinfect, before we can put skin, we've got to stop. Pastor, how do I fix my marriage? Well, first, let's stop the bleeding. Come on now. We'll, we'll worry about fixing it later, but, but how about y'all stop saying mean things to each other? Let's leave the mother-in-laws out of the conversation. Look, come on, somebody say, stop the bleeding. Stop, just, just, let's just not make it worse. After hemostasis is called the inflammatory stage, and that's where it may swell up, but the body is actually disinfecting the wound site. The third stage is where the flesh and the muscle and the skin begins to reform. And then the final stage, this is a church word, is the maturation stage. The final stage actually takes the longest, sometimes up to a year. And even though it looks healed, it's the stage where that skin is getting strong again and getting its elasticity back. I sound educated, don't I? I knew I was coming to Houston, so I got to show off that University of Maryland degree. I got me one. Your body heals itself. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when God was talking about his church, he was talking about the believers that he gathered. He calls us a spiritual family, but he also calls us a, a body. And by the way, the body heals itself. One of the things that I can find is dangerous in a church like Hope City that is such a move of God where thousands of people are getting saved and delivered and transformed and their lives being forever flipped right side up is it's easy to come to a church like this and to feel invisible. It's easy to come and be like, well, I don't really add much. They, they, they don't know if I'm there. They're not going to miss me if I'm gone. I'm not on a platform. I, I don't make a big difference. I'm kind of just doing me. It's easy to feel like you don't matter, not understanding that if you're in this body, you didn't get here by chance. I know you may have seen some IG post or a co-work may have ID or whatever it may be. No, if you're here, God put you here. And if he put you here, he didn't put you here by accident because he doesn't build bodies by accident. You are here on purpose for a purpose. In 2023, somehow we've relegated church to be a place where I just run in real quick, show up a little late after the second song. Y'all know what time church starts, right? I think it's posted on the website. Check it out. Anyway, run out before the message is even Oh, I got to beat the traffic. Church is not a place where you just come to hear good information yeah. that picks you up and encourages you and sent. No, 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 no. This is a body, an interconnected community that God designed to need each other and to heal one another. If you're here, God puts you here. If you're here, this church needs you. I'll give you just three quick thoughts, three quick thoughts. Can you, can you write this down? Is this a note-taking church? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't. By the way, I don't know if anybody ever told you this, but you are 85% more likely to make it into heaven if you take notes in church. <laughs> hey, I'm trying to just give you the best shot I can possibly give you, trying to help you out. Since we're throwing out statistics, please know 87% of all statistics from pastors are made up, so you can take it. <laughs> First thought is this. This body was designed to heal. This body was designed to heal. You, you, you've got to be all of 24 hours, years old before you find out that life is great, but sometimes life hurts. Life has a way of wounding you. Some people say it this way, life be life in. What does that mean? It means life is ghetto. That's what it means. It, it means just sometimes where I could do with Life just has a way of wounding you. 
For some of us, life wounded us before we even learned to read. It was the house we grew up in. It was the mom that was there or not there, the dad that was there or not there, the, the, the experiences that we had coming up that, that wounded us in a way that we can't even put into words. Some of us were wounded by our family of origin. And I discovered if I don't have a biblical worldview, I could be angry at and maybe even hate the family that wounded me. But, but when I understand God's word, I realize if they were able to wound me in that way, imagine how somebody wounded them. I'm thinking dad was messed up, mom was messed up, not realize dad received that wound from granddad. And dad just passed it to me so I can pass it to my son all in the name of I'm making you a man. Not realizing these are generational wounds that we're passing down. For some of us, that wound came later on in life through, through a tragedy, through, through, through a trauma encounter, through abuse, through some foreclosure or some divorce or something like that. Something we didn't pick, something we didn't plan, something we wish hadn't happened, but now it's a part of our story. Some wounds from family, some wounds from trauma. The, the last source of wounds is the one I don't like the most. Uh, those are self Inflicted wounds. Anybody be honest enough to say there's some wounds in my life? I can't blame my mama. She told me not to go. Can't blame my dad. He told me not to date her. <laughs> Holy Spirit said stay home that night. And here I am thinking, next thing I know, I've got my heart in my hand. A thousand pieces and I've got nobody to blame but myself. And the wild thing about these type of wounds is I'm not sure what hospital to take them to. Because when I cut my arm, I go to urgent care and get a few stitches. When, when I break my leg, I go to the ER. But where do I go when I break my heart? Where do I go when it's my self-esteem that got cut? Where do I go when it's my confidence that's wounded? What we do is we just start looking around. Well, well, they're wounded. Let me see what they do. And as I watch their life, they're kind of just limping their way through it. It makes no sense crying over spilled milk. So I said, hey, guess that's life. Life is tough. Life is difficult. Just keep going. Because everybody knows that time heals all. Said no doctor ever. <laughs> oh, you broke your leg. Just give it some time. It'll be fine. Your leg gonna fall off. <laughs> so we've got these wounds in our soul that we don't know what to do with. We keep trucking on in life, and because the pain increases, we begin to look for medication. Some of us look for medication through love and relationships. If I could just find somebody in my life that can love me for who I am and I could pour my life into them, maybe it will make me feel better on the inside. And what we do is we surround ourselves with people, even serving people at our own expense, giving them more and having less to offer every single day. For some of us, we were told, hey, yeah, you've gone through pain, but if you accomplish something great with your life, at least the pain will be worth it. So pain drives us to build wealth and, and to get these accolades and accomplishments and degrees and we've stacked degrees and we've got zeros in our bank accounts and we have all these accolades but yet somehow still feel empty on the inside. And there's a season in someone's life where they give up hope of healing and now all I need is just to feel numb. And here comes the vices. Here comes alcohol, here comes drugs or sex or whatever I can do just to not feel anymore. Because A, no one told me life is painful, and B, no one told me where do I heal from that pain. In Acts chapter 9, verse 11, it says this. So the Lord said to him, Arise, go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him that he might receive his sight. This is talking about who we know to be the Apostle Paul. But before he was the Apostle Paul, he was a blind man named Saul. 
You see, they told Saul that if you got an education, it would make the pain that you've been through worth it. So Saul became a Pharisee, which was some of the most educated people in the land at the... Do you know to be a Pharisee, you had to memorize word for word the first five books of the Bible by the age of 13. Can you imagine? Some of y'all can't name the first five of the books of the Bible, period. (laughs) Don't play me, Pastor. Genesis, Exodus, Ezekiel, Malachi, first and second, third, John. (laughs) Word for word. And with all that education, it didn't make the pain worth it. And Saul found himself with a run-in with God, lost his sight. And here's what he did. He locked himself in a room. He said, I will not eat. I will fast until God heals me. Now hear me. When you read your Bible, don't just read it like it makes sense. You ever read your Bible something made absolutely no sense? And you're just like, amen, and you just kept on going? (laughs) Someone's reading the Bible like we're supposed to be confused. No, if you read your Bible and something don't make sense, stop, pray. God, that don't make sense. I'm missing something. What am I missing? I'm reading this. Saul is saying, God healed me. And God said, no. And you know, when you've been in church too long, you start throwing God's names back at him. Oh, you Jehovah Rapha. You're God, my doctor. I think that's what that means. You're supposed, God refused to heal Saul. Saul's praying for healing. God ignores him, which, by the way, is a different message. Just because God hasn't answered you doesn't mean he's not working on the solution. Saul is praying here. He goes to Ananias, and he said, there is a believer that is crying out to me, and he's waiting on a connection with you so that he can receive his healing. And I'm looking at this, and I'm like, God, why would you not heal him yourself? The Holy Spirit says, Stephen, because I'm trying to reinforce my order. Forgiveness comes from God, but healing comes from his body. The Bible says this in James chapter 5, verse 16. Admit your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be, what's that word? Healed. Come on, Williams. Come on, Katie. What's that word? So that you may be Heal. It says the earnest prayer of a righteous man has great power and wonderful results. Now, some of y'all are offended because you don't recognize this verse because you're like me. You grew up in church from baby, so you, you only know King James. You're like, wait, that ain't the verse. The verse says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth. <laughs> Sorry about the splash zone. <laughs> What's an availeth? <laughs> Much. As you know, there's a lot of different translations of Scripture. And when I read that verse, I'm not going to lie to you, I picked the most obscure one, the one that says, admit your faults. You know what the majority of translation says? It says, confess your sin. One, two, why didn't I read that one? Because y'all church folks, as soon as I say sin, y'all start tripping. Sin? No, he ain't talking to me. I'm holy. No sin in my life. (laughs) Because when we think sin, we think our ratchetest day ever. We think in spring break 07, you and your best friend said, don't you ever tell anybody what happened here tonight. And they're like, I won't tell. I went and told three people before you went to bed that night. I won't tell no. Sin does not mean your deepest, darkest secrets. Now, it does include that. (laughs) But that's not what it means. The word sin means to miss the bullseye. It means to be out of alignment. It means to be off track. The Bible said any area of your life that is off bullseye of God's best for you, you got to tell somebody. And if you tell somebody in that moment, God will bring healing. Hey, if I'd be honest with you, when, when that business closed at the end of the pandemic, it wasn't just the business that closed, it was my hope. That closed with it. It's the last time I said I'll ever take a risk. Never again. When when that person walked out of my life, it's not just that person that left. It was my self-esteem that left. The Bible says if you would just admit this is off of God's best, there's healing in that moment. Second thing is this. Write this down. Write this down. Healing takes time 
and discomfort. He, healing takes longer than we want, and it's more painful sometimes than the wound was in the first place. I had a friend that, I don't know what they were doing, jumping off high stuff or something like that, but they dislocated both shoulders, had two rotator cup surgeries. I'm like, bro, you got to chill out with that. <laughs> and as I was talking to them, said, tearing my rotator cup was not the most painful part of the experience. Yeah, it was painful. The shoulder popped out. They popped it back in. I blacked out. Can't quite remember that. But as I waited for the surgery with the torn rotator cuff, it wasn't painful waiting for the surgery. He said, actually, the surgery wasn't painful at all. They knocked me out. I don't even remember. He said, it was painful is when I woke up. Some of you had surgery before. You know when they give you, you're like, give me that strong stuff, okay? We'll worry about it later. But I, <laughs> I don't want to feel anything. You got that time where, where, where it's not time to take the next pain medication, but, but the old one has worn off, and you got about 15, 20 minutes. And then that nurse walking them out on a scale of 1 to 10, where's your pain? 18. <laughs> you just start, man. Ow! <laughs> because sometimes, all the time, healing hurts. My friend that had surgery said, for three months, I couldn't sleep in a bed because if I laid flat, the whole room would spin. I had to lay in an armchair all night long, not able to sleep as my body was healing. Here's what happens. We, we realize that, 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 that abortion wounded me, that divorce wounded me, that foreclosure, that termination, whatever. But then when we begin to evaluate how painful it is to heal, we're like, nah, I'm good. I'll be all right. <laughs> I just stay like this. I mean, I'm making it. I'm making it. I, I'll be so we begin to fake healing even though we're not really healed. Hear me. Nobody fakes like church folk fake. And I'm not trying to say that just to get a reaction. Like, sometimes I feel like as church folks, we got to fake. You see, if you're out in the world and you're wounded, you can be out there with your wounds. Everybody out there wounded. It's just like, whatever. It's Friday night. Listen, my only plan tonight is to black out. It was a good night if I don't remember. And all your friends are like, yeah. You ever tried that in church? You imagine you come in the lobby of church and be like, this Friday, as soon as I get out of small group, I'm a black. Yo, they will grab you, take you off of some prayer room, cast out whatever you got. You may never get out of church. I can't. So I got to pretend I'm healed even though I'm bleeding. We walk into church about God is good. All the time, all the time, God is good. You a lie. How are you? Oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Well, listen, them shopping bags under your eyelids make me think you pretty stressed. Oh, God got up. I'm still down, but God got up. And, and we put on this facade of being okay because it's painful to admit I'm not okay. I need some help. Hey, got to keep it 100. Some of y'all don't like me. That's all right. My wife likes me. I'm going home tonight. It's all good. <laughs> You're not fooling us as much as you think you are. You think everybody thinks you have it all together. Come on, nudge your neighbor and say, we know. We know. you ain't. And what we don't even realize is we've now created an entire vocabulary around our brokenness. We stay so, man, that person just pushed my buttons. You mean they touched a wound? And it hurt, that's why you cussed them out? That situation just triggered me. You mean something you went through reminded you of something in your past you're not yet healed? Wrong. I've been married going on 10 years, coming up in August. It's been the best seven years of my life. I'm telling you, it's... <laughs> I'm going to pay for that one when I go home. <laughs> you know, the Bible says that the two shall become one. So I made a decision that when I get married, I want my wife to have all of this. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna bring it all. So, so she got all these good looks. She got all these student loans. She got, all, she had everything I had to bring. I said, I'm gonna bring my anointing. I'm gonna bring my rejection issues. Um, I'm gonna bring my. Now, I didn't show it to her in like the first two months because I didn't know if the marriage certificate was dry yet. I don't know if you're gonna know that thing. So I was on my best behavior about eight weeks in. But after eight weeks, she just got Stephen. And she just had a way of just pushing. It happened the first year of our marriage, happened the third year, happened the fifth year, happened last week. She just has a way of, it would usually be something like this, where she said, hey, babe, 
And I'm thinking it's going to be a good night. Yeah. And she goes, don't forget to take out the trash. Simple, right? Something about don't take out the trash. It's just, something just started to rise up inside of me. And you know, I wanted to be biblical, so I call her what Jesus called people in the Bible. Woman! You don't think I remember to take out the trash? Why you always got to treat me like I'm some little boy? I'm the man of this house. I could Now, mind you, we got three weeks worth of trash stacked up in the garage. I done forgot the last three weeks, but I'm pee. Don't remind. I, you think I'm some little boy? She like, well, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What did she do wrong? Nothing. It was just something inside. That's something that we don't even realize. Yeah. There's something in me that needs help. There's this moment in scripture where Jesus came to the Pharisees and he said, I am the truth and the truth will set you free. Look how they responded in John chapter eight, verse 33. They answered him, said, we are Abraham's. Do you know who he is? And have you, we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say we shall be set free? Jesus said, I'm the truth. I've come to set you free. They said, we don't need freedom. We ain't never been slaves. I have a real question. Not a rhetorical question. I need you to answer me. Okay, you ready? Here's the question. Willens, Katie, H. Crew. Have you ever read your Bible? That's the end of the question. That's the question. That's... Show a hand. Show a hand. Show a hand. I don't know. You know, 2023, they just... What part, pastor? Any part? Don't even matter where you read. Pretty much the whole thing, Israel, slaves. <laughs> Read Genesis. They made it like, what, 20 chapters? Next thing you know, slavery in Egypt for 400 years. Since Moses delivered them, bring them out in the wilderness, the second they get into the promised land, they were free for like 15 minutes. <laughs> then here comes the Philistines. Game over. They get free from the Philistines. Here comes the Moabites. Moabites leave. Here comes the Ammonites. Here comes Babylon. Then finally we get to Malachi, just able to breathe. Whew. Whole book we made in slavery. When God asks them, do you want freedom? The moment they said, we have never been slaves. The moment those words left them, at that exact moment, they were slaves to the Roman Empire. Which tells me that denial is not just a river in Egypt. That's a good preacher joke, ain't it? That's a, that's a, yeah, I've been working on that one. <laughs> Y'all too kind. <laughs> it's easier to pretend like we got it going on than to admit, not okay. I need, I need some healing. Oh, we'll, we'll take a test. We'll take a test. I'm telling you, this is a foolproof test. This will let you know if there's wounds inside of you that still need healing or if you're good to go. If you pass this test, this message don't apply to you. If you fail it, you need this. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Everybody inhale, exhale. If you were able to do that, you broken, you broken, you broken. You just, no, seriously. If you're breathing, you're broken. Not as broken as you were yesterday, but not as healed as God wants you to be tomorrow. Another test is this. If there's an area of my life where I'm not seeing God's best, there's something inside of me that's broken. Listen, if your money's funny, your heart is broken. If your relationships are chaotic, it's not them. Because the Bible says, may you prosper even as your... And here's the thing. God has created an emergency room, a hospital, a therapy, a place for the parts of you that medical doctors can't heal to be healed. And it is the house of God. Somebody say amen. As a pastor, we just got to get you to stay. You would not believe how many people run out in the middle of the operation. Question for you. If you have an open heart surgery, they just cut you open to sleep, we're gonna fix you. When's a good time to leave in surgery? <laughs> just think about it. What's a great Wait, can you imagine? And then cut you open, got the clamps. Doctors like hand me the scalpel, you're like, no, no, I'm good. I feel a little exposed. <laughs> it's, too, it's too much transparency. <laughs> Doc, I'm gonna leave now. 
<laughs> and I'd be like, well, you are exposed. <laughs> but you can't leave now. You, you, you should have left before we cut you off. This is not the time to leave. If you leave now, we can't guarantee it won't get. And I know you feel exposed, but here, we're professionals. We've done this hundreds of times. We've got people watching your vitals. This is a safe environment to heal. If you leave, I can't guarantee it won't get worse. People be leaving church for the dumbest reasons. I know, I can say that. I ain't your pastor, so you don't got to like me. You're going to change it. Oh, my gosh, the traffic was unbelievable. I am not going to church. This man hung on a cross for nine hours for you? You can't sit in traffic for three minutes? Come on. I went to the church, and they didn't recognize the anointing on my life. They made me go through their growth track. I'm like, do you know I am minister, whoever? I'm not going back. Really? You're going to let an encounter with another wounded person drive you out of your place of healing? Listen, God's got you right where he needs you so that he can heal and restore and deliver so you can go back and live a life full of abundance. Just don't leave in the middle of the process. How, how does God heal? One way God heals is through his presence. You ever come to church, first note of the music, the tear just starts streaming down your face? Especially for us men, we're like, I don't cry. There must be dust in the air. I don't know what it is. Don't you dare be ashamed of tears coming down your face in church. What you don't know is that's God doing surgery on your heart. That is the Holy Spirit healing parts of you that you didn't even know. Okay. Another way God hails is through prayer. He said, when you get with somebody else, maybe in a small group, he said that prayer is effective and it's fervent and it brings healing. Areas that you didn't even know about. Another way that God heals is through his word. Psalm chapter 107 verse 20 says this. It says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Do you know how God's word heals you? Well, in order to understand how God's word heals you, you have to understand how your wound really is. Your emotional wound is actually a lie that you've believed. So when you hear the truth of God's word, it eradicates that lie and brings healing to your heart. For example, you think it's that abuse that wounded you. It's not the abuse that wounded you. It's the lie that you deserved it. That's what the wound is. You think when that person walked out of your life that, that that's what wounded you. That's not what wounded you. What wounded you is the lie that you weren't worth sticking around for. And when you sit under preaching and you begin to hear, wait, God bankrupted heaven for me. He gave his only son to purchase me. I am invaluable. It's their loss, not mine. His word. Here's, last thing is just write this down. If they come play, I'll stop preaching. If they don't play that piano, I'm going to preach till Jesus comes back. Okay. <laughs> Y'all think I'm playing. Three. Write this down. We are healed. So they came running out, didn't they? Let's gotta get this guy out of here. We are healed to heal. God didn't just heal you for you to go home happy. He healed you so that you could heal somebody else. Now, if you don't know me by now, I should sing the song. Got time. I'm a little ignorant, okay? I'm a little disrespectful. I said things I ought not say. So I'm preparing you because if you get offended in the next few minutes, it's your fault, not mine. Okay. You ready? You ever been to a funeral? Everyone's like, oh gosh, where are you going? No, you ever been to a funeral? And there's always that one person at a funeral, usually an aunt, that's just extra. They just, oh my God. You like, close the cash before they jump in. Oh, oh, my, oh my God. They, they were such a good person. Who's ever said they're a bad person at their funeral? Like, of course they're a good person. And then they just say some dumb, oh, I, I guess God needed another angel. That's, that's not where angels come from. That's... That's not even biblical. That's not how that works. And they're trying to pull in everything. We, we gonna make it. We gonna, we gonna make it. I don't, I don't know how, but we gonna make it. And you're like, I don't know if you gonna make it. <laughs> what are they doing? They're trying to comfort others when they themselves haven't been comforted. Church, hear me. 
You can't give away what you don't have. And we've got a lot of church leaders, small group hosts, dream teamers, members, maybe even some pastors. They're trying to give away a healing that they've never first received from God themselves. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and the Father of Lord Jesus Christ for the Father of compassion and the God, what's that word? Of all. Whatever you've been through, God has comfort for it. Who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You have come to church for many reasons. One being that God can comfort and heal you. But hear me, after you've received that healing, don't you dare keep it to yourself. How dare you run to your car and drive off to live your great life when there's somebody sitting two rows behind you and three to the left that need the healing that God gave you. Hear, hear me. There's somebody in the middle right now of what you survived. And they're wondering, can I make it? Where is God? What, should I give up? I don't, and, and, and you've survived. None of you survived. You've healed. You've, and here you are mad at God. God, why did I have to go through that? God, God, why was I the one? I know you healed me, but it doesn't make sense. God says, listen, I didn't cause that pain. I healed you from the pain. But now can we use that to turn around and encourage somebody else and let them know this period is not the end of your story. Your best days are ahead of you. There's so much more that God has for you. Maryland, a few months ago, I was walking to the store to grab some food, and the cashier said, hey, pastor. I was like, how's it going? He said, I, I finished growth track today. Y'all gotta understand, okay? I'm a little cranky after I preach three messages. I'm like, I want to be like, so, but I can't say it. <laughs> right, here's what I said. Wow, you finished growth track. Great. Are you on a dream team? I was surprised. She's like, yeah, I'm on a dream team. I said, which one did you pick? She said, greeters. Come on, where the greeters at? <laughs> greeters in Houston are anointed because it is hot as Hades outside. <laughs> you out there in hell still smiling. Welcome to church. <laughs> I said, why'd you pick greeters? She stepped from behind the register and said, come over here. I'm like, oh, Lord. Freedom Conference. And <laughs> she said, the first time I came to church, I told myself, if church doesn't work, I'm going to take my life when I go home. I said, oh, I'm listening now. She said, from the first note to the last prayer, I cried the entire service. She said, but for the first time, it wasn't tears of pain or sorrow. She said, I couldn't explain what was happening inside of me. She said, after church, I went out into the lobby and the service was over, but I was afraid to go home because I did not know if those suicidal thoughts were waiting for me when I got home. And her words, not mine. She said, I was standing in the lobby like a lost puppy. That's the phrase she used. And she said, some greeter came up to me and said, I don't know what's going on in your life. Listen up, you nosy church folks. She said, I don't need to know what's going on. Use that line, mind your business. She said, but the Holy Spirit said to give you a hug. Do you mind if I give you a hug? This girl said, Pastor, that hug healed me. She said, I joined Greeter's team because I want to be able to give another lost puppy a hug that does not know what they're going home to. And watch this. She said, and I know what they look like because I used to be one standing in the lobby. Hear me. Some of you, God has healed you from some things, but you can still recognize it on other people. You can, you're going through it right now. You're going through it right now. And that person needs the healing that God has placed inside of you. That's what the church is. That's what the body is. A group of people that have been healed are being healed and are hearing others to the glory of God. Go through growth track. Join the greeters team or one of the other teams. Don't just rush out. Linger in the lobby and just see who the Holy Spirit draws your attention to. You need this place. But there's somebody in this place that needs what God has placed inside of you. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful. God, we are thankful. Come on. Can you just open your hands right where you're sitting, all the locations? God, you're healing right now. God, you're restoring. God, you're reminding that not one person is abandoned. That what the enemy meant for evil, God, you're going to turn it around. 
be a beautiful part of their story. Right where you are with your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you could pray this prayer with me, say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just give God a moment to make this supernatural moment real to you. For some of you, God's healing you. For some of you, God is reminding you your story. For some of you, if you would be honest, you'd have to admit, I know church, but I don't know God. I've never actually given my life to Jesus. Maybe you're like me and you grew up in church and you know all the church stuff, but you've never surrendered to the God of the church. Or maybe you're new to an atmosphere like this. You didn't even know God wanted you. Guess what? He does. Now that you know, how you going to act? You're in here and you say, I need Jesus in my life the way you're talking about, Pastor. You can make that decision right now. You say, I need Jesus. Do me a favor. Pray this prayer with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for thinking about me when I wasn't even thinking about you. It was your blood that erased my sin. It was your death that forgave all my mistakes. In this moment, I surrender. I give you all of me. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, can you celebrate for every single person that made the greatest decision ever? God bless you.